Welcome to Conservation Conversations, the podcast where we discuss emerging technologies, global trends, and the future of biodiversity conservation. I'm your host, Sean O'Brien, President and CEO of NatureServe, where we leverage science and technology to protect endangered species and ecosystems around the world. Welcome to this month's episode of Conservation Conversations. I'm excited to be here this month with Scott Laurie. Scott has a bachelor's and master's degree in biology from Stanford and a PhD in environmental science from Duke, where he attended with one of NatureServe scientists, Regan Smythe. Before working at iNaturalist full-time, Scott was a research fellow at the Global Ecology Department at the Carnegie Institute for Science at Stanford. And in 2011, he helped launch iNaturalist, which is the biggest citizen science app in the world in terms of contributors and numbers of species included. It is also a really amazing in terms of the contributions these data make to our knowledge of the natural world. iNaturalist is a part of the California Academy of Sciences, where Scott also worked with NatureServe's chief scientist, Healy Hamilton, and with our newest, one of our newest staff members, Giovanni Rapaciulo. So we're excited to have all of those connections with Scott, and we're really excited that Scott and his collaborators have created this wonderful resource for the world. So welcome, Scott. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It's great to chat. Yeah. So uh, most people know what iNaturalist is, but just in case there's one or two people out there who don't know, tell me what iNaturalist is and what it does. Yeah. I mean, in a nutshell, like the kind of core activity with iNaturalist is like you're outside in your yard, you go outside and you see something that strikes your interest, a living thing. Maybe it's a butterfly or you turn over a log and see a snail. So you take iNaturalist and you would take a picture of it or point it at the, at the creature. And iNaturalist will tell you more about it. It will identify it. And, but importantly, it'll also allow you to post this as a citizen science observation where you can connect to people from around the world who can help put that observation in context. And hopefully you'll join them to make what could be a really important discovery. Maybe it's the first time that thing has been seen in that area. Maybe it's a new invasive species, et cetera. Um, so that's what we're trying to do, get people outside connected to nature, but also really advance science and conservation. That point is something I really wanted to ask about because it's super exciting. We now have, instead of hundreds or thousands of professional biologists of different kinds out looking for species, literally millions of people looking at things and seeing things and going places where we might not be able to send a professional because we don't have the time or the money to get them there. So tell me, are there some really amazing finds in terms of, say, a species that was found that maybe we didn't know existed anymore or was in a place where we were so surprised that it turned out, or maybe it's just not as endangered as we once thought it was. Yeah. And what's been really exciting as the platform's grown is we're now getting those kind of discoveries every, um, every week or so. And, and, um, but there are, I mean, I do it every week. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're at a gradient, right? On one end you have like rediscovering the ivory bill woodpecker, which is, you know, the cover of science material, which <laughs> hasn't happened in, in our dreams. <laughs> in our but dreams. then you have, you know, <laughs> first first thing in this park or things like that but they, and there's that spectrum of 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 excitement but what i think is really important and cool is that for the people involved in that discovery it's it's super important on any level and just i think the ability to bring people into sort of the, the i mean probably have both you and i are in science is that sort of thrill of discovery and learning and advancing our knowledge um is that's that's i think a really neat hook to and my hope with iNaturals has always been that by by having that real authentic authenticity of science and conservation and that real sort of earnest and genuine pursuit that we can get people involved in a way that they wouldn't be involved in, let's say, just a game app. But at the same time, we can do science and conservation that we couldn't do without having the help of, of like you're saying, the millions of boots on the ground around the world. I um, mean, just, uh, just one example, I, I, this is for a couple of years ago, but I thought it was a neat one is there's a, um, there's a group of school kids out on a beach in Santa Barbara and this, do you know what an ocean sunfish is? This big, oh, yeah, yeah. mola molas, they look like they're flat, you know, huge fish with one eye on one side and another. Yeah, and they're around. gigantic. Gigantic, yeah. And one of these was washed up on a beach and this group of school kids side and, you know, poked it in and took pictures of a posted to Thai naturalist. And there is the, the ocean sunfish that occurs here, but they connected pretty quickly on a naturalist with this whole group of ichthyologists out of Australia. Who, and one was the person who just who described um, this Australian species of sunfish, which had never been seen in the Northern hemisphere. But what I loved about it, and I think this is the best of that world I was talking about. It was like, 
we think it's this, but we need you to go back and open its mouth and look for that one tooth there, the spine on the fin. And there was sort of this back and forth. And to have on one end of that conversation is a bunch of school kids like, wow, you know, this is really, this is really exciting. On the other hand, like you're saying, people in Australia who would never be able to check this out, working together to, to make those discoveries is just, for me, that's what it's all about. That's fantastic. And that's one of the things that's very cool about your user base is that it's so big that the world's experts on species are participants and they see an observation and they think, Oh, somebody posted a picture of a sunfish. I should check it out. Even though I'm in Australia and the picture's from California and lo and behold, just like that, we expanded the range of this fish or maybe it just got off track a little bit, but there's more information now. I know people who are bat specialists who check out bat observations in their state every single day and provide identifications and use the data to expand their understanding of bats. That's awesome. I think it's really exciting because we're contributing citizen science or community science and achieving conservation goals. And I know conservation goals are one of the things that you are interested in for the platform. Yeah, and I think this is a really important thing and why, you know, it's great to talk with you and is, is you know, a lot of people think of you know the iNaturalist is just the citizens, but iNaturalist only works when there's really deep involvement for with quote unquote experts, or for lack of a better word. But it's the people who can be part of that community, and we hope this community is a big tent that includes you know young children and a lot of different participants, but really needs that expertise in there. And like you're saying we're really interested in figuring out ways to have that win-win beneficial system so that the professionals can see that this is this is helpful. This is worth our time and engagement work. But at the same time, they really do get a, you know, it's not a waste of their time because iNaturalist wouldn't work if it was just a bunch of, um, you know, people beginning kind of people who are just getting started with nature. It needs that, that well-balanced community of participants. Yeah, of course, I've put in a number of observations, uh, nothing like the number that you've put in, which is truly astounding. <laughs> uh, I think you're now well over 20,000 observations in iNaturalist. Yeah, um, it, but it's funny for me, you know, I, I had kids my kids are now uh, uh are now uh, uh three and seven and pretty so much pretty much like six years ago i sort of like way tamped down the observing but really got into the identifying because for me that's a way i can vicariously i used to travel a lot and it was fun to be an observer now i sort of vicariously live through other people <laughs> and, and do a lot of ideeing but it's interesting how there is that kind of balance yeah but my my observations the last couple of years have been shameful but my identifications have been good uh, excellent well, one thing that's been very interesting as I have traveled around the country meeting with natural heritage biologists has been to see them pull out the iNaturalist app and to record observations and in some cases even use the function you have built in that uses artificial intelligence to help people identify uh, critters in the field. Uh, so in some cases, your software is helping field biologists do the identification or at least get close to the identification. And then they're recording it and putting it out there in the world for people to see. I suspect that when you were first getting going, that you never thought that professional biologists would be using this as an actual tool to get their jobs done. Yeah. Um, you know, well, it's, 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 it's great to the extent that, that the more, I mean, just thinking the more we can get the professional community involved is that makes the experience for people who have really are just getting started with nature for the first time so much more fulfilling to have that, that diverse community. So yeah, that's, that's fantastic to hear that. Uh, I know that you organize observation days and events. Uh, talk a little bit about what kind of events people organize around using iNaturalist, because I know that's a great way to get more people engaged. Yeah. It's, you know, it's funny because I, I sometimes think of iNaturalist as like going for a run, right? You can do it on your, on your own. You can just go for a run and that would be like taking out the app and taking a few observations things you see but you can also go for a run with a couple friends that might be organizing a hike and sometimes that's more target based like let's go we want to fill this gap on the map or we want to look for these things but then there's also i would say the sort of equivalent of like the 10k you know community fun run or like the you know, american ninja warrior like whole infrastructure around you know this activity is something called a bio blitz right which predates iNaturalist and bio blitz i think started with E.O. You know, Wilson back in, you know, the East Coast kind of thing. But it was, you know, it's really a community coming together, working with the scientific community to inventory as many things as you can find in a place at a particular part of time. And this is something that was done with pencil and paper. And I think what's been nice for us is as we were kind of 
building iNaturalist. We're working hand in hand with the BioBlitz community. That's a, the BioBlitz is a thing that anybody can do, but National Geographic kind of took up the, the brand of the, of the BioBlitz and really kind of did a lot of iterating on how can we make iNaturalist a better, better tool for this activity. And you can do a BioBlitz with anything, but you know, I think iNaturalist is a, a very common tool. And um, we have a lot of projects on iNaturalist and, and many of them really are sort of BioBlitzes. They're like floor of this park or this class, which is a group of people going to this place at this time. And, um, and we just, iNaturalist is a great way to sort of turn that experience of going out and exploring things into a nice little um, summary that you can go back to and visit. And also is real scientific data that is, is immediately getting out there and joining other data to have the scientific and conservation impact. So let's talk a little bit about the conservation impact. Are there examples of people using iNaturalist data to help make actual conservation decisions? Yeah. Um, and so, so I, I would say almost on three levels. One is very, just by having our platform where people are working together and, and set up these projects, it's a, I'm not saying it's doing everything. I don't want to take any credit for that, that but it is providing a space where we can um, help facilitate some local conservation projects. I was looking at one the other day, which was a park that has a, a nice newt migration about this time of year. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them just get hammered on the roads and it's just, total carnage. And so they want to put in some um, underpasses and things like that. And they want to know where to put those. So they have a naturalist project and trying to get people to go out there and, and observe squished newts on the road to try to figure out if this, these crossings are happening at certain places. Right. Um, and that's something that, you know, could be happening without us knowing. And there's also similarly a lot of studies. So iNaturalist is one of the things that we're just proud of is, is, is kind of bringing biodiversity data into the kind of big data world. I, I mean, but the goal here is you think of a satellite as taking, you know, it took small vegetation plots of which we had a handful and brought it to this real streaming big data that big data analysis tools can be used for. And so what we're trying to do with, with biodiversity data and alongside other great citizen science projects like, um, like eBird. Right. But if you, if you look at the um, amount of data that's been posted to GBIF since 2020, so that's the last two years. And GBIF is a group called the Global Biodiversity Information Facility that consolidates about 60,000 data sets. Um, since 2020, the non-bird, because again, eBird is huge in this world, non-European, for some reason, European has this very old um, citizen science projects that are contributing a lot of data. Interesting. But 85% of the non-bird, non-European data since 2020 came from INAP. So then a lot of the conservation comes out on just INAT data ending up in these studies. So again, on the road mortality thing, I, I, there was a study just this last month, which was taking INAT data from GBIF with other um, data sets and looking at you know patterns of road mortality. And GBIF does this neat thing where they track how many times a data set has been cited scientifically. Mm -hmm. And INAT has the most the most citations of any of those 60,000, which is over 2,000. Really? So those are two ways that I think we're having local conservation and science impacts. But what we're interested in doing on a different level is, is trying to figure out ways to provide tools for the community to kind of do conservation in partnership with other groups on the platform more. And that's one of the things we're really interested in talking with groups like NatureServe and then learning how to do this right. Right. So of course, GBIF is a great partner for NatureServe as well. And our data goes into their system. And it's a fantastic service that is provided for the world to have access to all of this amazing biodiversity information. One of the things about iNaturalist is that the data are available, right? And it's essentially open data. And that's a great thing because it means people have access to this information, but some of the information is restricted or needs to be restricted. So can you tell me a little bit why that's important and how that works? Yeah. And I think this is a really um, interesting thing with iNaturalist. We're sort of sitting between like a social network, right? Where certain things like personal privacy or, you know, and you know, if you delete your Facebook account, you want it to be deleted. Um, and also the, the scientific sort of realm where the idea is that this stuff is published, it's there forever. Um, and, and trying to navigate that well. And that hits a lot of pieces of INAT, like things I mentioned with personal privacy and sort of the how how set in stone everything is. But it also, for me, it's analogous to the um, the sensitive species thing, which is in many ways, I naturalist is, is all about public participation, open infrastructure for science, getting as many people involved as possible. But we also have to realize that, you know, some of this information is sensitive and, and it, it can be used to um, harass or, or, or hurt these populations that we're trying to save. And, and naturalist isn't like Wikipedia where we're like, we're just creating information, get it out there. You can do whatever you want with it. We're trying to say we're, we're actually trying to do that, but we are trying to establish a culture and a 
push towards um, our, our, our mission is to is to not only connect people to nature, but through that connection, facilitate the, the protection of species. So we really want to make sure that we're getting that balance right. And I'm not going to lie, it's hard because on one hand, you have these values of public participation, getting as many diverse people involved as possible, which we think is a really, really important goal. But on the other hand, we have to recognize that we have to make sure that some of this really sensitive species data is restricted from the public and in and, and moving through to have an impact in terms of the conservation community through a different channel. And, and that's, again, why it's been very useful uh, working with, with you guys at NatureServe to figure out how to get that balance right. Yeah, that's a tough one for us as well. And, and some of our partners, in particular, our partners in Canada, they're very interested in open data and making information about what they've seen available. But there are certain species, and you know this, uh, in the United States and Canada, but people don't think that much about poaching in the way we do about big game in Africa, for example. But there are many poachable species that are highly endangered. American ginseng is a great example. Anybody who's talked to me in the past months has heard me say Venus flytrap many, many times because they're an amazing plant to see in nature. Uh, and many, if not all of us, have seen one in a terrarium or a botanic garden or something like that. But you can only see them in nature in a couple of small places in North Carolina and South Carolina. Even though the observation would have been obscured in iNaturalist, as a group, when we were out in the field, we made a commitment to not post the Venus flytrap observations to iNaturalist because it's so poachable and it's so endangered and so fragile. It was an interesting dilemma especially because I'm such a believer in open data and that people should have access to the information. But if you're talking about some plant or animal or some species that is highly endangered, you have to think twice because people may go and collect them. Yeah. But, and as you mentioned, you know, so that data on a natural, so would be obscured, which I'm confident does a fairly good job of keeping that data um, from the public, but at the same time, yeah. it does give you, it means that it, it's difficult for us to figure out a way to, scale the process of getting that information into the hands where it can actually have an impact in conservation. And a lot of this is, is about scale, right? I mean, the um, it's, it's easy on small scales to get, you know, vet, do vetting processes and move data around. But if you want to say, we really want to get hundreds of millions of people around the world participating, we have to figure out ways to scale um, all aspects of that, you yeah. know, in terms of like also things like misinformation. This is something that I, I worry we haven't had a lot of, um, deliberate misinformation on naturalists. I think there's a lot of people who make mistakes and then everybody's sure. you know, the spirit of correcting them together. But you look at what uh, deliberate misinformation has done to a lot of social networks like Facebook and Twitter. And, you know, that that's a, I think it's a question of scale. So what we're really interested in doing is, is trying to figure out how we can get more and more people involved and make sure that we maintain the standards that we have of, of data quality and really just just that it feels like a it still feels on a natural it's like it's a small community of people who are you know, relatively intimate and know one another and we know that gets harder the, the large, larger you scale so yeah in many ways i feel like the, the question the questions you're raising are these sort of growing pains and, and things we have to f- make sure we do properly and, and don't don't destroy what we have that's good while we have this ambition to have it operate at a larger scale wow you you've grown so fast and uh, i'm sure it's been a lot of sleepless nights trying to figure out some of the things and to make it all work technologically as well as philosophically. Uh, I find, and I'm a scientist, so maybe it's different for me, but I love it when someone corrects something that I've done on iNaturalist. Uh, Like if I identify something incorrectly and someone's like, no, 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 this it's this other thing. I think to myself, Oh, that's great. Uh, I, now I actually know, and I'm building my own knowledge base at the same time. And someone else who's identified it correctly probably is happy because they've had uh, they have an interest in that species and that's why they bothered to uh, take the time but and it really feels like a community of people who pat each other on the back yeah yeah no, i mean one sort of so silly and arbitrary benchmark but we have so the computer vision model which you mentioned where you can automatically identify species we include any species in that that we have a hundred observations of okay. or less because you don't have enough data to sort of give the model something to hold on to. And right now that's about 50,000 species. But for me, and I said my roles kind of shifted more to an identifier. It's nothing makes me more excited than when I can sort of 
figure out how to identify some obscure crab or something. And then I can kind of comb through our naturalist and, and find, you know, a hundred of these things or get people excited, you know, cause by you could get people who are, who are in these habitats and are posting these things, but like, this is a really neat species. You know, we, we, in many cases, these species don't have any photographs of, or just very, very few points. And just that sort of working together over with people, it's, it's kind of like the modern pen pal people that you don't see, but you're interacting yeah. with online yeah. to collectively get the species to a point where, so we know a lot about it. You know, we know where it is, we know what it's doing. We know we can identify it. Um, it's just, for me, that's just really satisfying. Yeah. I, I just love your enthusiasm. You're 10 years into this project and it sounds like it's the most fun that you've, you're having in anything that you do. It's just awesome. Um, Scott, you mentioned eBird several times, which is an amazing service and a platform that's out there for birders. Uh, and because most people are doing their observations on their phone, do you find that there's some bias in the kinds of species that people are identifying in INAP? Uh, so, you know, with plants and slow moving insects, it's easy. But I see birds out my window pretty regularly, and it's hard to get a decent enough photo on my cell phone to actually post it to iNaturalist. Yeah, no, it definitely. And, and part of, and I, I completely agree, I have a huge eBird fan and a huge, you know, birder as well. And, and part of me, part of me, my excitement getting into iNaturalist is looking at what was happening with birds just naturally. And kind of, as you mentioned, even pre this kind of camera iPhone world and being like, wow, how this is fantastic, but this is only happening for 10,000 species, right? Which is like 0.5% of the, the number of species in the world. And why isn't this happening for these other groups like plants and insects. And I do think that a part of that is that the, it, with groups like bird watching, you know, it's a tractable enough set that the observing and the identifying can be done by the same people. Like the task is let's go on a hike, see a bunch of birds and identify them and report our list. But you can't, you know, you can't expect anyone to be able to do that with these groups like beetles and things like that. So what really the technology of like sending the iPhone and the camera, the photo evidence, but then building up this big network is enabled to kind of segregate those worlds. So your your job as an observer is just to go out and document as much as you can. And then the, the identifiers can help actually put names to these things. So you kind of have a partnership. And what I also like about it is that we've done some work to sort of show how genuine this is, but I think it, it it's not just anecdotally, it does kind of hold up is that most observers are quite locally restricted, but they are taxonomically pretty diverse. So we'll have people that are, you know, they're passionate about some corner of the world, you know, they love this place, but they're posting frogs and orchids and beetles and whatever. And then a lot of the identifiers of the experts are globally agnostic, but they're specialized in a particular branch of the tree of life. So maybe they're the world's dragonfly expert or the world's like dart frog expert. And it's almost this like combining, um, you know, this, this intersection of, of the specialization in a certain corner of the world where people are passionate about particular branches of the tree of life where all this fruitful new stuff happens. And it's like, oh, wow, you know, you 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 went on this hike, saw all this stuff, but you, we actually are getting these things to species for these groups that we know very, very little about. And that's another reason I think it's important that iNaturalist is a, is a global platform. We've really tried hard so that it's it stays close to the ground, right? It stays to grassroots, bottom up, close to the ground. But I do think there's a strong argument that by being a global platform, we're facilitating that kind of neat, you know, world's expert in Beatles is over here connecting with someone who happens to be seeing beetles over here to help um, increase that process of, of making cool discoveries. Yeah, I, I love the way you think about your data more than just the species. Uh, people are the ones making the observations and doing the identifying. And so you have to think about the people and the species and the interface between the two. And I love how you analyze both the data in both of these directions. Um, so I wanted to ask you a question about uh, you, but before I do that, I just want to remind people that they can find iNaturalist on the uh, iOS store and Android by going to their app store and uh, searching for iNaturalist. It's a lot of fun and it's free, and so you should install it and give it a try. But I wanted to ask you, Scott, what inspired you to follow this career path? Uh, one of the things I think about a lot is you know, you go home after college from your first semester and you say to your parents, hey, I'm going to study botany. <laughs> your parents say, really? Uh, why don't you study art history? There's probably more jobs <laughs> there. And of course, at NatureServe, we want more ologists, biologists, zoologists, and all those things. Uh, so I want, always want to talk to people about who have made careers out of doing things in conservation, about how they got to go down that path and what their decision process was. 
Because at one point in your career, it looked very much like you could become an academic scientist. And now you're doing something very different and you're expert with your expertise and your knowledge. So tell, tell us a little bit about your path. Yeah, um, definitely. I mean, I think what I've always just been obsessed with biodiversity and, and nature and, and creatures and critters and species. And, and that's what, for me, when I, I wanted to do that and I went into ecology and, and environmental sciences, because that's what really got me excited. And, and it really is, you know, um, it's not saying that I don't care about, you know, ecosystem services and, you know, carbon and all these things, but I always felt like the, the no one was really putting biodiversity on the table. It's like the decisions were being made based on ecosystem services and, and um, carbon and things, but not biodiversity. But I did in academia, I felt like a lot of, as you're saying, that a lot of the kind of more um, the job opportunities kind of push you in that direction of energy or, and I was always like, well, shoot, this isn't, you know, I really want to, I want to figure out a way to, to preserve this, these, you know, hundreds of thousands of incredible species that we have and make sure that we, we are able to shepherd these through this incredible biodiversity crisis that we're going through. And I, and I didn't feel that, um, I, I, like you were saying, I didn't feel that the, um, there were opportunities. It just felt like I kept getting pulled into sort of more of the energy side of, of environmental sciences. And so then, um, I very fortunately met, uh, my partner, Kenichi Ueda, who started iNaturalist as a, um, a master's project at Berkeley two years before I met him. And I think I was, I was in the Bay Area and I was just, think about the scale of the conservation crisis that we're facing and that, you know, this has to happen in the next couple of decades, or we're going to completely miss the boat on this. And just how I didn't feel like what I was doing in academia was meeting that scale. And then here in the Bay Area, all these things happening around you. And I'm not saying that, you know, these silly apps that are come out of the Bay Area are actually doing really good, but there is that sort of like, there's something new here. There's something that can, 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 can scale at an interesting rate. And I just very fortunately met Kenichi, Um, and the minute I saw a naturalist, and it, you know he had a naturalist was up as a website. I was like, this is what I want to do, and I managed to lurk around academia as a day job for a couple of years after that. But I was like all in on a naturalist, and you know, we started an LLC, and we um, we launched our first mobile app. You know, the couple months after I, I met him, and been still at it. And uh, just saying, for me, it's just. Um, What's been exciting is I do feel almost like the last decade we've been kind of building this sensor, getting the getting the mirrors and the sensors right and getting it into space. And now it's it's working at capacity to start answering some of these questions and really having an impact. So it's kind of fun to look up and be like, now's the time to actually almost get to work on what I wanted to do at the beginning, which is actually use this instrument to have a real impact. So iNaturalist is like the web telescope, but pointed towards Earth. It's, it's really cool. Uh, <laughs> Also, I'm thinking that Kenichi must have had one of the most successful master's projects in the history of master's projects to now have millions of people using this app and contributing all of this data from what started out as a, as a master's project. It's truly astounding. Yeah, and I'll just speak for both of us that we've just been both been so lucky. A, the team that we have is just an incredible team. I just think about, you know, just and we've had so many people who've been supportive of us and and open doors for us and and, and an incredible community of users and we just were really really fortunate to be able to like you say explore in this space where there's it's it can be really hard just to even find an opportunity to be in this space and and, and have a paycheck. <laughs> That's awesome, Scott. Um, is there anything else that you want to add for the cause that I miss? Anything that you think is key? No, and I just want to thank you guys for all the incredible work Nature Service is doing. I mean, I think so much of what we're trying to do to provide context on species and help people understand that when they're looking at something, it's not just a pretty picture, but it's actually this is a species that, you know, is really sharing the we're sharing the planet with in many ways, even though our lives are enriched by species too, these species depend on people caring about them and, and the work that Nature Serve does to really help bring all of these diverse species on people's radar screens in terms of the conservation landscape and the policy landscape is just really, really important. And I hope that we can build those bridges more. Thank you. Uh, and I also want to say that I know our staff is really enjoying working with you and others at iNaturalist and figuring out how the data can be shared. And it's really exciting that you're out there and contributing to all of this. So thank you for all of that. And thanks for being on Conservation Conversations and good luck in, with the continued growth of iNaturalist. Thanks so much. It's great talking to you.